Although locomotive models had been built since development of the full-size engines, one could say that the live steam hobby of today was started at the end of the 19th century by some pioneers and was gradually developed, mainly at the beginning of the 20th century, by, among others, the Englishman Curly Lawrence, called LBSC, who designed and built a great number of locomotive models based on real prototypes. Many other modelers followed, and live steam grew to be a railway hobby spread all over the world. Martin Evans, also a Briton, is one of the great designers of today, though the drawings we are skimming through here are by the Dutchman Roel Fortberg. The essential purpose of the hobby is to build your own locomotive, driven by live steam. To build this type of steam engine is time-consuming work, incorporating all types of precision mechanical operations. It's no hindrance if you already have some knowledge and ability, but you probably need to have the odd screw loose to be mad enough to dedicate the time and energy to achieve your goal, a fully operational engine rolling on the track. Although many hours are taken up with lathe work, milling and drilling machines, to say nothing of all kinds of hand tools, probably the most important element is a burning interest. It is wise to devote the necessary time to plan the work and in what order the different parts should be manufactured, for every detail depends on its suitability to the previous one. Everything has to be tested over and over again and small adjustments must be made to achieve the right fitting and finish. After a while, it should be possible to do initial trials on a test bench, where the tuning, configuration and adjustment of the valve gear for the best driving characteristics are conducted. Because the full-size locomotives were always built using rivets in girder and sheet joints, we do the same when building models. This often means hundreds and sometimes thousands of holes drilled and riveted before the work is complete. Of utmost importance when making a rivet joint is that it is absolutely straight and that the rivets are always at exactly the same distance from each other. 
These rivet joints are of great importance in giving the model a realistic and finished appearance. Here we can see the cab being formed. Rivet joints are seldom used in the industry today, but it is probably the jointing technique that for eye and feeling give the most sympathetic impression of natural simplicity and strength. Copper tubes of different dimensions are cut and bent, tested and adjusted, so as to feed the various places in the machinery with steam and water. The pipe arrangement should have both a neat look and function well. To withstand the rather high temperatures the steam can reach, around 300 degrees centigrade when superheated, silver solder is used. Soft soldering pipes and pipe nipples is quite unsuitable. The steam pressure has to be checked continuously, for which one or more manometers are used. Important details for the final effect are the various identification plates with engine number, the name of the railway company, as well as other information, such as the name of the manufacturer, year of construction, etc. The signs are copied from the original ones and are etched in brass or silver plate. The fitting of one of the headlamps is checked. Ja, då återstår det att prova lite grann hur Island låter. Inte så tokigt va? We need track to be able to run the train, but first a suitable area is required, very often a problem, since a fairly large space is necessary for sufficiently gentle curves. The most common solution is a club railway, which usually is built by the club members on an area at their disposal. If you are fortunate enough to have a space on your own land, it is just a matter of beginning the navvy work. After planning, laying out, and levelling the area in question, a trench about half a metre deep is dug and filled with coarse aggregate and finally ballast material of finely crushed stone. On this bed, what are called battens are laid. These are longitudinal, laminated bearers of impregnated wood. On top of these, the track is built of sleepers and rails. Here the work is going on with a three and a half inch gauge at a scale of one to sixteen at ground level to make it look more realistic. Normally, and for most hobbyists, 
Part of the charm is to ride on the train, sitting behind the engine, handling the driving manually. So it is common to build the track about 70 centimetres above the ground to get better balance and a more convenient ride for the driver and his passengers. An attractive appearance can be given to the operating area according to taste and interest. The track system uses points, shunting lines and signals, some electrically operated, others manually. In spite of the many enjoyable hours spent in the workshop and the no less wonderful summer days navvying, the excitement comes when engines and rolling stock are brought out and it is time to get up steam. Here we are at the engine shed where several locomotives are in the process of getting steam up. At a siding, wagons are waiting to be coupled up. And here, an electric locomotive completes the railway picture. This one is a real old timer, the English Lion, from 1838, when she worked on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway. In the engine shed, we begin by filling the tender with good quality coal for efficient heating. We also fill up with water, clean and soft, to avoid calcium deposits in the boiler and pipes. Then we start the engine warm-up by using paraffin-soaked charcoal. And for special effects, we, do, we put Det här är en fotogen träkod för att starta elden med. Ja, det är lättare att få fart på den på träkoden. Sen när det har börjat brinna ordentligt i träkoden, då lägger man på stenkod. The fire is lit with the blur running. Now it's time to put in coal and the typical odour of coal smoke is smelt. Any no. water anymore? No, we don't need water. Okay. Okay. 
Do we go to two? The steam pressure increases, and when it's reached about 50 pounds per square inch, we run onto the turntable and pass onto a side track for coupling up the carriages. Now we're ready to go. The most common way to drive a live steam train is to sit at the controls, not as here in a coach, but on a special sitting trolley. Here, the engine is radio controlled to get a realistic feeling for the train, its coaches, and the railway environment all to the correct scale. There is work for more than one to handle the whole business during an operating day. Every engine requires an operator. Another is occupied handling the shunting and signals, and yet another takes care of anything else. It's very important to keep a close watch on the water level in the boiler, not allowing it to become too low with the risk of boiling dry, which is disastrous as the boiler may be seriously damaged. The fire also requires to be checked and replenished continuously to keep the steam pressure at the correct level. An American locomotive, class J1484 Pocono type, is now under steam on the track. It was built in 1942 
for the Western Maryland Railroad by Baldwin Locomotive Works. This model was built partly from original drawings and partly from drawings by the well-known live steam constructor Martin Evans, who named it Columbia. Ready to run, the engine weighs around 100 kilos. As the name live steam implies, steam power is number one in this hobby. But a representative of electric power is this model of the Swedish D engine, which dominated the engine park of the Swedish railways from 1925 to the 60s. For practical reasons, we run the locomotive with battery power instead of the usual way by contact wire and pantograph. The interior furnishing of coaches adds a lot to the feeling of reality.
small Dutch engine, 240, from the 1880s. The name of the original was Leeuwenhoek and was built at the German Borsig Works. This model was built by the Dutchman Roel Fortberg. For testing, we couple up quite a recently built model of a Swedish restaurant car, Lithera R03 from the 30s. Sorry, the restaurant is still closed. But anyway, it seems more important that the coach runs smoothly and without any problems. Traffic moves on, and it is more than usually exciting to drive a train at night. Live steam hobbyists operate in many different classes, depending on size. The most popular gauge is 5 inches, but here we go for the heavyweight class, which is 7 and a quarter inches gauge, or the scale of 1 to 8, which means double the size of what we saw earlier. As you might imagine, 
It's a rather demanding task to transport and put engines of this size onto the track. The weight, depending on the type of engine, can vary from 100 kilos up to more than 1,000. In Boros, there is the only club railway in Sweden. It's well developed and a good example of excellent work carried out by the club members over many years. Here we can see the master builder Bengt Jansson with his newly built supermodel of the engine William Shakespeare, which is in the English Britannia class and was in reality one of the last engine types built in England before the steam era ended. This is the most frequently used size of model for passenger traffic in regulated environments all over the world, such as in parks or, as here, in a privately built club railway. After half an hour, the steam pressure has built up and preparations for running continue. Here we mention, as an aside, that there is only a small group of live steam builders in Sweden, while there are tens of thousands of individuals abroad. First of all, we perform an all-round check to test the engine and get an indication that everything is working properly before the passenger trips begin. Now for the briefing before the day is running. <laughs> In the engine shed, a number of locomotives are checked for the tasks of the day. Here is an English Black 5, another one of the fine engines built by Jan Sun. The locomotive park is dominated by English engine types.
A pannier tank engine leaves with a freight train. All aboard! Take your seats for a ride on the Sunderland Railway. During our trip along the railway, we passed interesting old sites. Somebody answers the call of nature in the open air. The landscape of the operating environment was built by Niels Graf Ström. <laughs> These engines develop a lot of power and could carry a load equal to 40 to 50 people about three to four tons, including the weight of the train. Because of such weights, it is doubly important that proper safety arrangements exist for passengers and spectators. One of these safety requirements is that boilers in use on live steam engines require a certificate of approval, which certifies that they can cope with the working steam pressure with a satisfactory safety margin. A boiler explosion is no minor event and mustn't be risked. Because the railway dawdles through different parts and types of terrain, we feel close to nature during our trip. The real highlights of the hobbyists 
are the international steam meetings, perhaps most usually in England or the United States. Here we are visiting a steam meeting in the little Dutch town of Leek, where this is an annual event. Come back to that. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's all, the air is all depend if it's the odd one or two, even now. We meet enthusiasts, not only from different European countries, but also from America, Asia, Australia and New Zealand. This is the accomplished builder, Ruhl Fortberg, from Holland. Many have been close friends for some time, while others are more recent acquaintances, and useful contacts are made. Personal experiences, interesting technical problems and ideas are discussed in a good-humoured atmosphere. Most participants bring their own locomotives and the running is scheduled according to timetables so that each is allotted a predetermined operating time. For the wider seven and a quarter gauge, the track is at ground level, but to carry an engine of three and a half or five inch gauges, the track is built slightly above ground level for better balance though the predominant 5-inch gauge can also run at ground level. Here we can see a variety of locomotive types from different countries and periods. Activities usually last for several days under festival conditions with music and in the evenings dancing and driving the trains in the twilight. Interesting and unusual. This is a so-called Garrett engine with two four-coupled drive mechanisms. This engine type was for a long time common in South Africa. Besides activities with railway engines of all types and sizes, there are other things going on, such as live steam operations with traction engines, ship and stationary steam engines of different kinds, and model exhibitions. The picture is completed by rows of booths and stalls selling equipment and other hard-to-find parts for the live steam hobbyists. Another great meeting place is Oeringen in southern Germany, where enthusiasts gather to share their common interest in steam locomotives. On such occasions, there are also a great many first-time spectators finding out about the hobby. Maybe one or two will get the urge to try a beginner's project. Ja, ich war, ich, ich war immer auch...
Less well-known equipment always attracts interest. A hobby like this, as is the case with most activities, should include many and various factors to be really interesting. At first there may be a personal technical interest, mainly focused on railways, their rich history and influence on the world's industrial development. When steam power seriously began to be employed during the early years of the 19th century, the foundation was also laid for our modern industrial society. Steam power came to be used for many different operations other than railways. For example, in ships, agriculture, the timber industry, various mechanical applications such as the textile industry and many other areas. Today it is still used in large steam powered electricity generating stations and central heating systems. In other words, this 200-year period represents an almost limitless resource of our social history. Live steam may be an unusual hobby in Sweden, but as we have seen, the international interest is considerably greater, which means that it is easy to find useful, friendly and welcoming contacts in other countries. All walks of life are represented among the hobbyists, and those who get bitten by this bug can expect to spend many absorbing hours throughout the years so long as their interest can keep up steam.